if you are rich, the responsibility that comes with that is making sure that you are using it to create more equity in the world. If you are just lazy and rich and greedy and rich mm -hmm. and selfish and rich, Ooh. you deserve to be eaten. I'm Vivian Tu, AKA Your Rich BFF and your favorite Wall Street girly. I'm Brian Walsh, AKA Dr. Money, and I lead financial planning at SoFi. And this is Richer Lives, the show that helps you learn how to use your money to live your best life. We all want more dollar signs on our bank account. But also more fulfillment, satisfaction, and success. So we're here to bring you conversations with inspiring guests. Who've been where you are and are now where you wanna be. And we'll provide guidance that aims to get you there step by step. Because everyone deserves the opportunity to live Richer lives. Brian, do you ever get the sense that the guests we have on the show aren't even just here to inspire the viewers, but inspire us? I know. I'm always amazed at how much I learn from our guests. Which is why I can't wait to talk to Elaine Welteroth today. You might already follow her on social media, but if you don't, Elaine is a New York Times bestselling author. She was the youngest and only the second black woman to ever hold an editor-in-chief title at Condé Nast when she was promoted to the helm of Teen Vogue in 2016. She's also a judge on Project Runway, a talk show host. She also created her own masterclass and writes an advice column for the Washington Post called Ask Elaine, where she helps people navigate life and career pivots. And most recently, She's a mom to her precious one-year-old son. She's so accomplished. I can't wait to hear more about her story and what comes next. Before we jump into this conversation with a true game changer, let's take a second to talk about one of the game-changing elements of SoFi as a financial institution, transparency. At the beginning of each show, we like to take a minute to cover some of the honest facts about all of us being here today. Being here is something I'm very passionate about, helping change the face of finances to be more inclusive, but I'm also getting my money right by being paid to be here, as is our guest, Elaine. We're what's called non-client promoters. And I'm a registered representative of SoFi Securities LLC and an investment advisor representative of SoFi Wealth LLC. Basically, in every episode of Richer Lives, it's my job to make sure that nothing said is false or misrepresents the truth around investing and is generally good information that helps people get their money right. Now that we've covered the important stuff, let's get to our guest, Elaine. Welcome to Richer Lives, Elaine. I am so excited to be chatting with you. I mean, you are a powerhouse. You are a talk oh. show host, you know, former editor in chief. Like, I'm so excited that you're here. And honestly, I was a little nervous in the back room getting ready for this. Like, am I going to ask good questions? Is she going to flip the script, start asking me <laughs> questions? <laughs> that might happen. <laughs> but at the end of the show, you can give me like a little bit of a report card and let me know if I got like an A plus or a B minus okay. or like didn't pass the class. Okay. Well, I'm actually honored to be here with you because literally every time I open my phone, there you are, my rich BFF. <laughs> schooling me on things I needed to know. And so I'm actually, I feel like I'm in the hot seat today. I'm like, the one thing that int intimidates me to this day to talk about is money. So <laughs> it's gonna, gonna take be a, a good one. Sip. I'm, we're just gonna just go easy on me. Yeah, okay. And we love to start every single show with a little bit of an icebreaker. It's a fun one. Okay. So don't, so don't feel too stressed. Okay. You and a thousand other people have survived an apocalypse and now you're tasked with rebuilding society. Casual. <laughs> Don't stress, it's all good. How would you change the way we reward certain professions? And to which occupations would you designate the highest salaries? Okay, I'm gonna need something stronger in this cup. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, here's what I will say. At the top of the, the pyramid would be teachers. Mm -hmm. They are the most essential workers in our society and they yeah. are so undervalued right now. And I think I understand that even more now becoming a mom and my child's only 15 months and I'm just like, am I really sending him into this broken school system? Mm -hmm. I, so that would be number one. I think that's a great answer because teachers are the reason why everybody else can even have their profession, right? 100%. And I also just think that we need different types of teachers as well that, that maybe we didn't even have. You guys are teachers. We need financial literacy taught in schools. I think that like 
we, I learn more from following you on Instagram <laughs> than I learned in my entire K through 12 and into college. Like there are so many life skills that we are not taught in school. So when I say in my new society that teachers are getting paid the most, there's also going to be a complete overhaul of what we are teaching and what the curriculum mm -hmm. includes and what kind of teachers we're pulling in for these kids. Yeah, we'll definitely have to dive into that because it is kind of like, okay, here, we don't teach anything about personal finance. Okay, go off to college. You're gonna get offered with credit cards, student loans, life-changing decisions. So yeah, something like that definitely needs to be addressed in the totally, future. Totally, totally. Wait, what would you guys say is like the highest paid profession in your world mm. of your own creation? Can I say financial planner? Oh, <laughs> that's a good Convenient. one. Okay. Yeah, I know, I know. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, I wasn't going to say influencer. That's embarrassing. <laughs> but, you know, I think I would probably agree with teachers too, just because, you know, these are people who work so hard. They are building up the next generation and they're really not compensated in that way. Like, it's embarrassing yes. that teachers are spending their own money yep. to try and build out these classrooms so that their kids can have a really enjoyable environment to learn. It's just totally. so important. Totally, I'm with you. All right, you can live on my planet, both yeah. of you. Okay, <laughs> I, I would say farmers, because I like to eat, you know? Yeah, what yeah. Am I gonna do if I, I mean, food, that's, that's true. I, we yeah. didn't think about the food part. Yeah, we don't want hunger games yeah. going down, no, so no, no, yeah, no. let's put farmers on the list. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> see, we got it. we're good to go. We're yeah. building society. Yeah. Glad we got to the bottom of that. Let's hit pause for a second and talk about SoFi. We'll be right back to get into some questions for Elaine's journey. Hey, Brian. What's the magical number where if your investments are returning X amount per year that you tell your financial planning clients that they're like doing well? So conventional wisdom would say if you're earning 7% a year, then that's considered mm. good. But I think people worry way too much about performance and not as much on purpose. So if your money is gonna be there for a long period of time, that's where you wanna earn higher returns and take more risk. But if you need it in the short term, you just wanna make sure it's there when you need it. Good point. That's why I love high yield savings accounts. It's such an easy way for your money to just earn money while it's just sitting there waiting to be used. If you're looking for a high yield savings account, make sure to switch to SoFi Checking and Savings at SoFi.com slash Richer Lives. Let's start to dig into your story and learn about your relationship with money. So a question we like to ask everyone that comes on this show is what does rich mean to you? And I think for, for mm -hmm. asking you especially, I'd love to find out not only that, but then has that definition changed since you became a mother? And then do you consider yourself rich by that definition? Yeah, so my definition of rich has definitely evolved over the years. When I was a kid, if you asked me that question, I would have said, anyone who has stairs and a pool is definitely rich. Like, oh, okay. definitely rich. <laughs> um, everybody on TV had yeah. stairs and I didn't have stairs. And so anytime I was going to someone's house, like my mom's friend, I'd be like, do they have stairs? <laughs> <laughs> it's like the one thing I wanted in my life. Um, I'm happy to say, I'm happy to report, I have stairs now. And now you're like, oh, you're good. so annoying. I know. Like, now I I'm like, walk up the stairs. don't fall down the stairs. <laughs> you got to put the extra gates up there and everything. Exactly, yeah. exactly. My definition of rich has completely shifted. Um, to me, today, rich is a mindset of abundance. It mm -hmm. is about moving through the world with a sense of uh, freedom and liberation and agency. It, mm. I think it's about living on your own terms. And in that case, I do consider myself rich, but I feel like it comes with a huge caveat because we do <laughs> live in a society where the, the, the whole like eat the rich mm -hmm. phenomenon is, is very, uh, it's alive and well and for good reason. Yeah. I, I would strongly advise anyone against identifying with the term rich as a badge of honor, mm. as something to put your pride in. I think that being rich in resources is a responsibility. Mm -hmm. If you have resources and wealth, and, and that can be in the form of, edu of education and information, um, it could be in the form of cash money in the bank, <laughs> it could be in the form of privilege. If you are rich, the responsibility that comes with that is making sure that you are using it to create more equity in the world because there are things that you are entitled to that everyone should have access to. And what are you doing to make that so? 
You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you're not, if you are just lazy and rich and greedy and rich mm -hmm. and selfish and rich, Ooh. you deserve to be eaten. Oh, okay. In my society. Yeah. You, you know, like yeah. you have to, what are you doing to make the world a better place with those resources that you have? Oh, that's such a thoughtful answer. And I love how you framed that. I'd love to know, what is your favorite money story on your journey to success? Oh my gosh, okay. Well, my favorite money story has not a lot to do with money, weirdly. Okay. Stay with me. <laughs> it has to do with gum. Okay. I, I like gum, I chew Stay gum. Stay with me, okay. <laughs> so growing up, for me, gum was like the most valuable resource. Like I was just uh -huh. like, mommy, could we get a pack of gum? Yeah. And then if she said yes, I was like, yes. And then I would take that gum, I would go home and I would put it in this drawer. It was my bank and I banked all of my stacks of gum. I literally like lined them up by color and flavor. It so was, you're not chewing any of the gum? No, I was, I was not chewing any oh. of this gum. I was saving this gum. Okay. This whole concept mm -hmm. of like saving gum reflects today how I save money. For me, it highlighted that like, I'm good at saving things that matter to me. And I translated that hoarding mentality from gum to money. So as I got older and my sort of values shifted and it, from gum to money, mm -hmm. I, I was so serious about getting money. I worked like multiple jobs in high school, starting from as soon as I could get a worker's permit. And I saved my money like I saved my gum. I think it was a blessing and a curse because in one way it, 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 I was a great saver, but I do think that it came from an unhealthy place and I had to work on that. As I, you know, got older and I was, you know, I had, I found myself like with a pretty great savings. It's like, okay, you also like eat the gum anime, you know, like <laughs> eat, eat the gum. And I, I had to like, you can spend the money. Yeah. Like most people, they, the habits that they learn when they're young up to age seven, like those stick with them for the rest of their lives and they kind of form their money personality. Yeah. So like my kids have the opposite problem, ironically, <laughs> but like, let's say that was my kid that was hoarding all of that. I'd be like, okay, let's figure out like how much are we saving versus how much are we enjoying? Because we yes. want to balance like current enjoyment versus future savings. Yes, so true. What I love about this is, you know, you seemed so risk averse with your little gum collection. Yeah. But in fact, you are quite risk taking. You know, in your book, you talk about how when you were an intern, you just oh my God. changed your title and just kind of worked in that upper level role until someone was like, oh, do you want this title? <laughs> and, you know, you clearly were willing to take that gamble. Like, talk to me about some of the biggest risks you've taken mm. and what, you know, your biggest financial wins were out of those risks. Wow. Okay. I'm a little embarrassed. <laughs> Even just you bringing that story up, I'm like, who is that girl? Like, I don't know who she is. She was so bold. Um, yeah. Basically, okay. So when, in my first job, which was actually, in, it started as an intern, uh, as an internship. At the end of the internship, which was supposed to be just summer, three months, um, they never told me to leave. <laughs> so I just kept showing up. And they kept paying me. So I was like, right. why am I going to bring this up? I'm yeah. not bringing it. If you don't bring it up, it's not a problem for you. It's not a problem for, for me. me. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll collect the checks. And I am going to make your, your, all of your lives so much easier for having kept me on, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it was an accident. <laughs> so <laughs> I was working. Eventually, I sort of, you know, I was said yes to everything. And I was taking on all these new responsibilities and duties. And I, essentially, one day, I just took inventory and I was like, well, basically, I'm doing the job of a production assistant, not an editorial intern. So, for clarity, you know, for clarity, for clarity, sake, for, yeah, clarity. for clarity's sake, I helped everyone out, and I just changed. <laughs> I, I was insane, and I don't recommend this, uh, just to be clear. But I changed my title. Um, I'm like getting hot. Like this is embarrassing. <laughs> Woo, I changed my title in my signature, my email, to production assistant. No one noticed. Then they started calling me production assistant. They started literally referring to me in ed editorial meetings as a production assistant. And so I was like, great, this is working for everyone. So I did that for a few more months. And then eventually I went in and asked for a raise to match the job that I've been doing. And who does that? By the way, like, <laughs> who does that? That is the most millennial thing I've ever done. And then when they said no, I said, okay, well, I'm going to... They said no. I, they to said the no. Race. 
They said no. And then I said, great, well, I'm going to give you a day to think about that. And I'm not coming into work tomorrow because I can't do this job for this amount of money. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it paid off. I came back the next day. I thought that like my life and job were over. Yeah. I thought I made a huge mistake. And my boss, I remember she said like, I walked in like with my tail between my legs and she was like, sit down. And she started off saying like, what you did yesterday. And I was like, that's it, that's it, it's over. I, like, it was like a pregnant pause, I like, wanted to die. And she was like, was very smart. I called the headquarters, I called the, the office. We have worked it out and we are giving you a promotion and here's what it is and don't do this again and don't you ever, like don't you ever do this again, <laughs> you know? But honestly, it, it, it got the job done for me. I mean, I, I truly felt like I was adding value above, you know, you were. $10 an hour yeah. and, I need, and I wanted to do this job. I just literally could not survive yeah. at that rate forever. So that was my first major like gamble that paid off. I will say, Probably the next gamble that paid off was, um, well, it's also something I'm not proud of and honestly was a mistake. <laughs> um, so I decided to follow my boyfriend to college. I was in a position where I was like a 4.0 student. I was a junior and senior class president. I had all these extracurriculars, varsity sports, all, all of it. And I really had always dreamed of going to Stanford, but then I fell in love and I didn't even apply to Stanford. Mm -hmm. or any other Ivy League or private institution. Like I simply followed my boyfriend to a state school and I got there and uh, he got arrested and went to jail the first semester. And I was stuck at this school that I didn't belong in by myself. And I was just like, wow, like first big life decision gone yeah. so <laughs> wrong. Like what was I thinking? And what I will say is it paid off because I made the most of that state university mm -hmm. education and I paid off my student loans within two to three years of, of graduating, after graduating. And that is a major accomplishment. You know, it was my first major financial accomplishment as a young person that I feel really good about. And I know that that would not have been possible had I gone to one mm -hmm. of these private universities um, or Ivy Leagues, you know, that I frankly could not afford. Mm -hmm. um, I had to pay for school by myself. I had to take out school loans and I was able to be financially independent as a very young woman as a result. I mean, with both of those, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, going on strike may not be recommended, but <laughs> then it turned into like, okay, how do I negotiate for what I'm worth and get to what I'm worth? Yeah. And then the second one, it's like, okay, this wasn't the intention. But how do I like minimize the amount of money I'm spending on college so that way I could pay that off and be financially independent and secure quicker? Yes. And that's actually a conversation that we have all the time as financial planners. So it's trying to figure out how to balance those things. So maybe it might not have been the intent, but I think it kind of got there. I also think that it's a great example that there's very few decisions and things that happen in your life that are the end all be all. Yes. If you are truly committed, if you have a dream and you want it bad enough and you are willing to hustle and like get where you want to go and make strategic decisions later down on the line, mm -hmm. you can get wherever you need to be. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be, you know, little Miss Harvard. You can be whoever you are. Exactly. And that also helps you, you know, save on the debt and pay it off two to three years. That's a really big accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You guys are making me feel much better about, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> about this very flawed decision I made. <laughs> yeah. So I guess, I'd, so I'd love to know, you put together a course on related to careers and in there you provide advice really to negotiation, things like that. I guess career and finances go hand in hand. So what would you say to people who would want to understand how do I negotiate better? Or how do I advocate for myself better? Mm. Those types of things. Yeah. You need to go into any negotiation with what I call your ceiling and your floor. Mm -hmm. So like what you, the, the, the top of the, the pay range that you're aiming for, and then like the very bottom that you won't go below. I think that helps you stand strong and a little bit firmer and, um, if you know that you won't go below this floor, it creates like boundaries that help you think about what you do, no matter what, what you're gonna do, no matter what they do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I will also say, you know, never accept a job offer without taking a night to think about it. Mm. That was a big lesson learned for me. I, I have been in a position where I was bullied to just like take what was on the table or it would go away. 
Like that's what I was told, that's what I believed. Um, it's incredibly unfair, but that does happen mm -hmm. sometimes. What I would say is if that's the situation you're being put in at the negotiating table, is that a place you wanna work? Cause it's a reflection yeah. of the culture. And um, talk about money, mm -hmm. just yeah. generally. Pay transparency, even among your peers, is so powerful. It puts you in a more empowered position when you are negotiating. Knowing what other people make for similar work, it, it puts you at an advantage in those conversations. But for so, much, so many of us, we're so discouraged from talking about money that we have no frame of reference for what the value is of our work. And so how can we stand up for ourselves if, if we're getting a bum deal? I don't think we do it enough. And it's, it's sort of a cultural thing that needs to shift, but it shifts with us. Like we have to make that change. So I think the, the middle part where you talked about being in the financial position to kind of have optionality to yeah. go or get let go. I think that's a conversation, not only does it tie back to your answer on the definition of richness, like that financial independence piece, but that tends to be a big part of conversations we have as planners is like, okay, you secure your financial foundation enough cash, no credit card debt, things like that. So then that way you have that type of flexibility and that independence to then make decisions based on, I guess, what you want to do, not what you have to do. Yes. So that, that tends to be a big focus of ours on the planning side of things. Yes, which takes time to get to. Like you're, yep. you don't really have that kind of leverage early on in your career, mm -hmm. but down the line, sometimes you have more leverage than you think and you don't exercise it at the negotiation table. Today's episode is really focused on careers, which seems like a funny thing for a bank to be talking about. But SoFi is so much more than just a bank. It's an all-in-one finance super app, and every member gets access to some really unique benefits. One of the benefits that every SoFi member gets is complimentary career coaching through our partner, Corn Ferry Advance. You know, the stat that really blows my mind is that if you're not negotiating your salary every time you get a new job, you're leaving a million dollars on the table over your lifetime. Exactly. So if you're going through one of these challenges, like the ones that we talked about with Elaine, whether it be hunting for a job, negotiating your salary, or even looking through a different promotion opportunity, you can always open up your SoFi app, then open up an account and schedule an appointment with a career coach today. Become a SoFi member now. Go to SoFi.com slash Richard Lives to get started. I wanted to circle back on something that you had mentioned, like being a woman of color, like we don't get taught how to negotiate. And trust mm -hmm. me, I know this, like being a young woman of color, starting my career on Wall Street, and you being you know, a young woman of color at the time, starting in a predominantly white woman industry, and you know, even having Afrocentric hair, I know you mentioned like it made you feel very other mm. and like you didn't belong. And I know there's a lot of conversation right now around affirmative action and how we can make sure that underrepresented communities can get a fair shot at literally anything. Mm -hmm. But that often can lead to, you know, people making comments about like, is this deserved or mm. is this tokenization? Mm -hmm. Have you ever experienced anything like that in your career? And what would you recommend to someone, you know, back in little Elaine days? Like, what would you say to them? Yeah. Oh, it's such a relevant and timely topic, unfortunately. Yeah. Like, I wish it wasn't so evergreen. But what I'll say is absolutely I relate to that the, the, the concept of like tokenization mm -hmm. and um, perhaps being in situations where maybe other people think that you don't deserve to be there mm -hmm. or perhaps you've internalized that messaging in society and you struggle with a sense of belonging. Um, that's the hardest piece to sort of uproot. And I think what a lot of people don't know about my career is that it started through a diversity pipeline program. Mm. I, I got my start in media through this program called the Multicultural Advertising Intern Program. It stands for, it MAPE is for short. Mm -hmm. And it, you guys, it completely changed my life. It completely changed the trajectory of my career. Truly, if I had not had that exposure, I would have never known to dream for the kinds of jobs that I've gotten and mm -hmm. succeeded at. Like, and so I think that just speaks to the necessity of programs like this that level the playing field and that open doors that wouldn't otherwise be open um, for people who are, you know, uh, you know, underrepresented in all of these industries. Right? Yeah. It all started because of that program. Um, 
But I will also say when I got to this internship, um, even though I came in with a co cohort of a colorful cohort <laughs> of, you know, other young kids of color from all of these different cities all over the country, we all landed in very, very white uh, advertising companies, uh, corporations that were like these global advertising giants and an incredible opportunity um, to start our career there. But the culture absolutely made all of us feel like we did not belong there. And it wasn't just coming from the top down. It was... It, we felt that from our peers, like interns yeah. that were our same age that we were paired up with who had come from these Ivy League schools. It was honestly an experience that nothing in life to that point had prepared me for. I'd never yeah. been around that level of privilege or wealth and entitlement and superiority. Yeah. There was a true superiority complex in which I would be sitting at this table with my peers who are interns and we were supposed to be working on group projects and they would literally not look at me. They talked to everyone mm -hmm. else. They all talked to each other. And I remember just feeling invisible. And here I am like this overachiever who's the president of my class and had been for years and like really sharp and, and had a lot to contribute, had a big voice. And I just shrank. I lost my voice. I lost my confidence. I felt like I didn't belong because I didn't think they thought I belonged. And I remember at the end of that internship, there was this, this girl. She came from like this really fancy school from this well-to-do family. And um, she kind of like became the self-appointed like boss of the peer, of like the intern like group. And the, on the last day she looks at me and she goes in front of everybody and she goes, she's like, you guys, one day when I'm the CEO, I'm totally gonna hire Elaine. And she said that to me like it was a compliment. compliment. Yuck. Like, and I just remember feeling like, here is a girl who sees my only value in this world as working for, for her. her. Mm. Not seeing that in fact, one day I will be the boss. Mm -hmm. who will be in a position to hire you, mm -hmm. girl. You know, She's like, work for you. Excuse me? Like, it was just such a, it reflected so much of the superiority, the air of superiority that I had been, like, invisibly battling. And it was actually clarifying. It was like, she actually yeah. said it. She, like, said something so egregious yeah. that, like, lets me know she sees me as less than. And I went through a lot of humbling things that I had to kind of build myself back from. Um, and I would say to anybody who understands what that is like to be tokenized or to be discounted um, or to anyone who's felt like they don't belong in these environments, these rarefied worlds and spaces, it's like, listen, not only do you belong, you have most likely fought harder, worked harder, swam upstream to get to the same seat that these people are at. You could swim circles around them. Mm -hmm. You know, like you are incredibly valuable in those seats. Don't you forget it for one second. Do not let anybody make you forget that. And your difference is your superpower. Like yeah. the thing that is making you feel othered or insecure or inferior, that is your superpower. Don't get it twisted. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I would say. Yeah. That's what I would say. I would say to your point, like, you know, being in a program like MAPE, you know, it's really easy to dream. You get into this program, you think you're doing everything right, but it's very hard to see yourself in a reality where you have never seen someone who looks like you succeed. Yep. And I'm sure that the interns at every place that you have worked have been so lucky to be able to look up the mm. ladder and see your face up there Ooh. and feel like they can ask you the questions that you didn't have anybody to ask. I hope so. Thank you for saying that. And I hope so. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing of you, like seeing a young, beautiful Asian woman <laughs> who's such a boss. You're gonna cry. I'm like gonna cry too. This is getting emotional. <laughs> Because it, it's sensitive stuff, you know? Yeah. It's like, but but I think like seeing somebody like you be so strong and and so smart about money, it completely like, 
it breaks down all the stereotypes that we've been told about women, Asian women mm -hmm. in particular. That were quiet. My mom was very sad that I was like very loud growing up, always talking. But I love that for you. <laughs> and like, that's what makes you successful. So I think it's all the things that you're taught to be ashamed of about yourself mm -hmm. that are actually your freaking superpower. You know, yeah. everything that I've been through and overcome that has got me, gotten me where I'm at has not just gotten me where I'm at. I hope that it has, and I know it has opened doors for other people mm -hmm. um, who look like me. A big focus for you is actually the self-confidence and empowerment of women. Yeah. And so if I just did a campaign of rebranding the new face of finance, basically allowing women to see themselves as financial equals to men, just as smart, just as capable, what advice would you give to young women who are looking to find their financial voice? Mm. Oh my gosh. I, first of all, I, I do write about this in my book. Mm -hmm. I, I spent a lot of time talking about this because I think that we were so damaged by the messages that we grew up with as women. I think about this like Disney princess syndrome mm -hmm. that we all inherited, watching these Disney princesses get saved by these mm -hmm. men who, and it created, even watching Sex in the City, like created yeah. this archetype mm -hmm. of the type of man you go after. Yeah. That's the man that you the marry. Prize. That's the prize. But we're the prize. Prize. And it took me so long to get to that point. I really thought that like the only way I was going to have this like expensive life was if I had a rich husband. Yeah. Cher said it best. Mom, I am a rich man. Yes, <laughs> I'm the rich man that I they told the me to man. marry. You yeah. know what I mean? I'm, I'm him now. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your story. It was amazing. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. Talking with Elaine was everything I thought it was going to be and more. She's so powerful, so insightful, and just so, so kind. Another great interview. I feel inspired after talking to her. 100%. If you like this episode of Richer Lives, then be sure to hit that subscribe button so you get a reminder to tune in next time. It's going to be more not to miss insight into how to live a richer life. Also, drop a comment letting us know who you'd like to see us interview. You can also find SoFi on TikTok, Instagram, X, and now on Threads too. And of course, on your phone. If you watched today's episode with Elaine and thought to yourself, wow, this is all really good perspective, but I wanna see how I can figure out the best path for my unique situation, then it's time for you to set up a session with one of SoFi's financial planners. SoFi's financial planners are kind of like therapists for your money. They can help you with big decisions like, am I saving enough for retirement or the day-to-day -day stuff? Like, I make good money, yet I still feel broke. Do I need a budget? The answer is always yes. <laughs> The thing that sticks out with me from our conversation with Elaine today is that everyone has their own unique gaps when it comes to their financial knowledge or financial literacy. And the great news is you don't need to go it alone. You can have a financial planner help fill those gaps. The best part is this is another complimentary perk of being a SoFi member. So sign up for that SoFi checking and savings account and make an appointment with one of SoFi's financial planners. You can get started by going to SoFi.com slash richer lives. That's it for today's episode. Catch you next time. Hi again, it's me, Brian Walsh, AKA Dr. Money, here to talk about some of the legal stuff. Though I am a certified financial planner certificate, your finances are unique. That means anything I talk about today shouldn't be considered advice. Think about it more as high level education or guidance. Also, please subscribe to our channel. <laughs> there he is, he's coming back in the form of this freaking fly. Yes, I'm now rich. Well, who's gonna take financial advice from your poor BFF? Right, 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 right. right.